Chapter 12, Part 2, Mongol Eurasia and its aftermath, 1200 to 1500. And in Part 1, we talked about the rise of the Mongols. In, in Part 2, we'll continue to talk about their, you know, their empire and their expansion. Uh, looking at our chapter overview, the top three there in the smaller font is what we did in Part 1. The larger font, the bottom, the last three are what we're doing today in, in, this, in this lesson. Uh, Mongol domination in China, 1271-1368. Uh, the early Ming Empire, 1368-1500. So the Ming Empire might be an empire that you've heard of before. We'll talk about why. And then lastly, centralization and militarism in East Asia, 1200-1500. Okay, moving to the next section in our chapter, Mongol domination in China. 1271 to 1368, how did Mongol rule in China foster cultural and scientific exchange? Okay, so the Mongols took control in northern China. But when they did that, they changed their policy. What they used to do is come in, invade, conquer, and then level all the cities that were, of course, very populated, displacing people from their homes. Uh... And then what they would do is create pastures for livestock and land for agriculture because that, that creates trade goods. But they don't do that in China. They take a, a different approach and they determine that what we're going to do is instead heavily tax the people. Leave them, leave them be in their cities, but heavily tax them. And this would prove to be more profitable. And the Chinese suffered greatly under this oppressive system. Life under Mongol rule was not a picnic. It was harsh and violent and unforgiving. So the Yuan dynasty we mentioned before in part one, uh, the, the Yuan Empire under Mongol rule, was a period of time when China was under the rule of the Mongols. Uh, and the Yuan would rule for 1271 to 1368. And would be followed by the Ming dynasty we'll talk about later here. Uh, so, you know, I, I, again, I mentioned that, you know, besides the, the Romans and the Greeks and the Egyptians and the Mongols, we don't know that many of these names, but the Ming might be one that you've heard of before. Uh, you, you hear about the Ming in today's times for, for a specific reason, and we'll, we'll talk about that when we get there. Okay, back to the Chinese and the Mongols. So the Chinese had fought with the Mongol tribes of the north for, for literally hundreds of years. But when the Mongols united under the leadership of Chinggis Khan, they swept across northern China, destroying many cities along the way. Uh, so the Mongols and the Chinese continued to fight for many years until Kublai Khan took control. So we remember Kublai, Chinggis' grandson. So Kublai eventually conquered most of China, including the Song and Jin empires and establishes his own dynasty called the Yuan. The Yuan dynasty, or the Mongols, are coming. So that's more of a joke, but uh, okay. Uh, so Kubla took on much of the culture of the Chinese. Uh, but although the Mongols were great warriors, they, they really didn't know how to run a large empire like China had been. So Kubla used Chinese officials to run the government, initially anyway. Of course, you're talking about, you know, the, the people that you just conquered running the country. So they're, are, are they going to try to sabotage us? Are they going to, are they working with us? Are they loyal? I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine that they would be. It's, it's kind of like the, the Nazis allowing the French to run the government during the occupation of France in World War II. They, they would never do that, but the, but the Mongols do. So Kublai is forced to keep a close eye on them because he didn't trust them. Uh, but, there, but there were positives. Uh, Kublai encouraged trade and communications with lands beyond China. Uh, and this, you know, this was key to Mongol success, the protecting the Silk Roads, making them safe again, you know, making them so people were not afraid to travel them. This all resulted in a positive, you know, with trade. Trade flourished. Uh, Kubla also brought in uh, people from all around the world. He encouraged science and culture. 
So not exactly a stereotype of what we typically think of the Mongols, science and culture. You think of, you know, barbarians and, and you know, raids and, and killings and pillaging and raping and destruction, and violence and fire and burning. But you don't think of science and culture. So, you know, again, stereotypes are born from people that want to paint a certain people a certain way. And over the years, we believe them modern history tries to undo those myths and talk about the truth. So the truth is that the Mongols have a lot of that going on, but they also have a, a fair amount of, of, of positives going on also. Uh, so Kubla brought in people from all around the world, and one of them was the famous visitor, or one of his famous visitors was Marco Polo. So Marco Polo came to China while Kublai Khan ruled the Yuan Empire. And I've probably said it before, but the, but the name Marco Polo, why is that used for that pool game where you close your eyes and you try to, you know, Marco Polo and your friends, you say Marco, they say Polo, and you try to catch your friends. Why, how did his name become the name of this pool game? Because in the game, when you're it, you ha if, you're, if you're playing fairly, you keep your eyes closed all the time, um, you know, you don't, you don't know where you're at, right? You're, you're lost. And that's really how Marco Polo kind of was on his journey. He didn't know where he was most of the time. He was kind of lost too and just kind of meandered around until he finally found a place to go. So that, that's where that name comes from. So, so Marco Polo comes to China while Kubla is ruling the Yuan Empire. And they have this inter interesting relationship uh, between these two men. Uh, let's go to our next film. This film is entitled The Mystery of Marco Polo's Journey to China, A Prisoner of Kublai Khan. Now, this is an animated film, but it's not exactly a cartoon. It, it's a film that's full of good information about these two men. So go ahead and watch that film, and then come on back. So Kublai also permitted freedom of religion, including Confucianism, Islam, and Buddhism in China. Uh... The city of Beijing, oops, sorry, became his capital. Beijing was the capital of the Yuan Empire under Kublai Khan. And Beijing became the center of culture, economics, and politics. Uh, so according to your book, what was Beijing? China's northern capital city. First used as an imperial capital in 906. And today, now, the capital of the People's Republic of China. So all these years later, still the capital. Uh, to keep control of his Chinese subjects, Kubla instituted social classes. And we've seen these pyramids before. This pyramid shows the social hierarchy of China under the Yuan dynasty. Uh, so, of course, the Mongols made up the highest class and were always given preference. Uh, below the Mongols were the non-Chinese races, the Central Asian nomadic peoples, the Muslim allies, the Turks... Below them, in the last two tiers, the bottom two tiers of the Chinese. Uh, first, the northern Chinese, and at the bottom, the Han Chinese and, and, and the minority people of the south. Uh, the southern Sung were considered to be the lowest class. Uh, so parts of the Chinese culture continue to flourish during the Yuan dynasties. Uh, Kublai Khan began a new era in China called the Yuan dynasties, we know. Kubla enjoyed Chinese culture so much that he moved the Mongolian capital to China. So the capital of, of, Mong, of the Mongols was moved to China. But by this time, Kubla excluded the Chinese from serving in high government offices because he didn't trust them anymore and relied on foreigners to serve in his government. So what's, what's worse? I mean, a, a foreigner doesn't have any loyalty either. So didn't exactly, um, didn't exactly uh, uh, solve his problem here. Uh, but the key is that the Yuan rulers encouraged advancement in technology and transportation, also encouraged the arts such as ceramics, painting, drama. And uh, interestingly, the Mongols became more like the Chinese over time. So again, the conquerors become like the conquered, unusual. You, you, you wouldn't think it would be happen that way, the conquered are going to take on the 
ways of the conquerors because they got defeated by them, but not the case, not always in history also. We've seen that other evidence of that. Uh, you know, Chinese culture is, is strong and the Mongols accept it and don't push theirs so much. Uh, and the truth is the Mongols were only a small percentage of the overall population anyway, and that's the way it, that's the way it always is with ruling classes, most ruling classes are a minority. Uh, some Mongols, however, attempted to retain their culture and stay with the old ways and continue with their base culture. Some can continue, continue to live in tents like they did in, in their nomadic days. And they only married other Mongols. So, of course, when you mix like this, people mix and, and, and different peoples marry and, and you have, you know, uh, uh, kind of cross-racial marriages, Mongols marrying Chinese. Uh, but the, uh, some of the, uh, the old-school Mongols refused to marry anybody else but other Mongols. But, of course, like any other dynasty, what goes up must come down. Same with the Yuan. There were some negatives as well. Uh, and you have the fall of the Yuan dynasty. Uh, when Kublai Khan died in 1294, the Yuan, Yuan dynasty declined, and we've seen this many times, from Chinggis to Kubla. These men are are you know devoted, and 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 they, it's it's the most important thing in their lives, their their empire. But then when they're gone, the people that come up next, perhaps their children, they don't have the same kind of inspiration and passion that the originals did. Perhaps they've been brought up with the silver spoon in their mouth and, and haven't suffered enough to understand what they're in charge of. So leadership declines, and that, and that, that leads to lots of things that, that could happen. You have frequent uprisings due to heavy taxes and corruption. So I mentioned before, the Yuan heavily taxed the Chinese, and it, it created rebellion uh, until finally a peasant leader named Zhu Yuan Zhang created a rebel army and toppled the Mongols. And we'll talk about that here more at length in a minute. Uh, so the population of China actually shrunk under Mongol rule. And internal strife weakened the Yuan Empire. Uh, but, so the Yuan dynasty was the shortest lived of all the major Chinese dynasties. Uh, after Kublai Khan's death, the dynasty began to weaken. Uh, the heirs of Kubla began to fight over power, and the government became corrupt. So again, the heirs of Kubla, he's gone. They don't step in and take charge. They're, they fight. I want to be in charge. No, I want to be in charge. And you have power, you know, power plays and corruption. This, of course, leads perhaps leads to an opening for a you know a potential, and you have a revolutionary. Uh, uh, Zhu Yuan Zhang, uh, he puts together Chinese rebel groups uh, and they were formed to fight against the Mongol rule that's diminishing. This happens in 1368 and he led the rebels and overthrew the Yuan. And this is where the Ming dynasty is born. So Zhu Yuan Zhang um, established the Ming dynasty in China in 1368 after defeating uh, the Yuan. And the next section in our book is the early Ming Empire, 1368 to 1500. In what ways did the Ming Empire continue or discontinue Mongol practices? Uh, so you have the rise of, the, of Ming China. So the Ming Dynasty is often called the largest of the great Chinese dynasties. And they ruled ancient China from 1368 to 1644, so almost 300 years. Uh, the Ming had an anti-Mongol point of view, but adopted many of the Yuan government policies. Uh, so the Ming dynasty, I mentioned uh, Zhu Yuan Zhang, uh, it developed from a series of rebellions that finally drove out the Mongols. Zhu Yuan Zhang led them and founds the the Ming Dynasty, also called the Brilliant Dynasty. Uh, so the Ming is often called the last of the great Chinese dynasties. They would rule ancient China from, from 1368 to 1644. Uh, 
and had an anti-Mongol point of view. So according to your book, the Ming was an empire based in China that Zhu Yuan Zhang established after the overthrow of the Yuan Empire. The Ming Emperor Yang La sponsored the building of the Forbidden City and the voyages of Zheng Ha. And we'll talk about Zheng Ha here at length in a minute. The later years of the Ming saw a slowdown in technological advancement and economic decline. So I mentioned before that this is an empire that many of us may know about. So why do we know about the Ming Empire today? What, what, what happens to bring the Ming Empire into our lives today? It's, it's their vases or vases, Ming vase, Ming vase, however you want to say, potato, potato, tomato, tomato, vase, vase. But they're known for their vases. Uh, very valuable today. If you have one of these, you got some money. Uh, these vases were made from a fine, very thin porcelain. And this is where the idea of fine china came from. So when somebody sits down at a table having friends over and they bring out their fine china, that's what they're talking about. Fine china is made in China, and it's made from this very thin white porcelain. I, I'm not sure if many people pull out their, their, their fine china today, but you probably heard that in the past. Uh, <clears throat> so as we know, prior to the Ming Dynasty, China had been ruled by the Yuan Dynasty, set up by the Mongols who conquered China about 100 years earlier. But of course, many of the Chinese did not like the Mongols and considered them the enemy, and they were finally overthrown and ousted by Zhu Yuanzhang. Uh, he took took I'm sorry he took control of China, and named himself the Emperor uh, Hongwu. And this is the official start of the Ming Dynasty. <clears throat> so the Ming was an era of large civil engineering projects. They almost completely rebuilt the Great Wall of China. So we talked about this way back in the very beginning of history in China and, and all these different dynasties come along and add to it or repair it. But the, but the Ming rebuilt it uh, solidly into what it is today. <clears throat> uh, it, it was in disrepair. So they, they built very tall and very wide walls made out of brick and they're still standing today. If you visit the Great Wall, uh, most of what the walls you see, the wall you see, is was was built by the Ming around the decaying uh, older wall. <clears throat> uh, they also rebuilt the Grand Canal. We've also heard of this before. This this canal that linked the Yellow and Yangtze rivers. Uh, this incredible trade avenue, this you know unimpeded avenue waterway that connects the north and the south of China, which of course you know. Uh, is a, a tremendous trade route, and of course the trade flourished up and down this this canal. Uh, the Grand Canal, rebuilt during the Ming, had a significant impact on trade, and helped the economy to flourish. Okay, um, the Forbidden City, uh, Beijing is known as the Forbidden City. This is also developed during the Ming Dynasty. So the city is where the emperor's palace was located inside the capital city of Beijing. Uh, and the emperor's complex had over, almost, I should say, a thousand buildings and covered over 185 acres of land. So why was it called the Forbidden City? Well, it wasn't really a city at all. The Forbidden City was the imperial palace complex inside of the city of Beijing. So here you see kind of a map of the Forbidden City. This is the Emperor's Complex that was inside the city of Beijing itself. Okay. It was called the Forbidden City because uh, uh, commoners and, and foreigners were, or, or even uninvited nobility, were forbidden to enter its sacred precincts. This, this is where the Chinese emperors ruled their empire for centuries, and they didn't want any anybody interfering with that. Uh, so that's the forbidden part of the forbidden city, not allowed to enter the the emperor's complex. Uh, let's take a break here and watch the next film. This film is entitled The Forbidden City. Please watch that film and then come on back. Okay, so, so art flourished during the Ming 
era. Literature, painting, music, poetry, porcelain, Ming vases, vases made of blue and white porcelain fine china were prized at the time throughout the world and are still considered very valuable today. If you, like I said, if you have one of those, let me know. Uh, I'll take it off your hands for 20, 30 bucks. Just kidding. Um, so culture in general flourishes during the Ming. Uh, literature reached new heights. And you have these great classical novels of, of Chinese literature being written during the Ming dynasty. <clears throat> uh, so the Ming government uh, had a centralized bureaucracy. And, and while we know that it can be somewhat complicated, and we talked about red tape, uh, we also know that a bureaucracy is almost needed to run such a large, you know, uh, uh, dynasty like, like the Ming. Civil service, civil, uh, civil service exam system. What is that? We have that today. People have to pass a civil service exam to get a job in the government or the city or whatever it might be. Uh, and the Ming have this. Um, so what's that mean? That you had to be qualified for a job. No longer given, jobs were no longer given out as a favor. So nepotism. Yeah, you know, my dad had a job, so I got the job. I don't have the qualifications, but it doesn't matter. My dad had that job, so I got it. Or my friend, or my wife's father, or somebody. I know somebody high up, so they got me a job. It's called nepotism. But no, not not here. Uh, you you have to pass this exam and be qualified to get the job. No longer as a favor. The Ming set up a national school system. Okay, and, and had, you know, uh, uh, systems for each school. So the curriculum's the same anywhere that you go. Uh, the Ming ran large numbers of factories and workshops, you know, before the Industrial Revolution. So, you know, um, kind of the precursor to that. Uh, of course, I mentioned the improvement of the Grand Canal, which was a shipping lane across China, a huge success, but also the Great Wall. That didn't have much to do with trade, but you know, it was part of their culture. Um, so, so again, the government's run by the civil service, and we have this today in our government. You know, we get we take difficult exams to get jobs in the government. Uh, so, in, in in the era of the Ming, the, the men with the highest scores would get the best jobs. So, a a man might study for years to try and pass the exams and earn one of these prestigious positions. Uh, they often covered a number of subjects. Uh, but interestingly, a significant portion of the testing was on the teachings of Confucius. So all these centuries later, all these different dynasties and leaders and some good, some bad, invasions and falls and declines and all of that we've talked about since this class started. Uh, Confucius remains a huge part of Chinese culture from, for the entirety of it. Uh, interesting. So notice I don't say that, that, that women were taking these jobs, or, or, or taking these exams, I should say, because women were, were not a allowed to take these exams and have those kind of jobs. It was for men only. <clears throat> uh, the, the men also used men who were eunuchs. Uh, what's a eunuch? A eunuch is a man who, who's been sterilized or castrated so they could not produce a family. Why would they want to do that to a man? Uh, so that man could not potentially challenge the dynasty someday. How would he do that? Well, many of these men were guards that might be the guard of where the women were, the women of the leaders or the emperor or, or their sons or whatever. And, of course, you know, men and women mixing might, might result in some kind of... Uh, you know, uh, a sexual encounter. Uh, and so the fear was if that happens, you know, a, an, an heir may not be the same blood. So how do we stop that? We sterilize these men. So many of these men in these positions were eunuchs. Imagine that the government forces a man to do that. Uh, pretty amazing. Uh, okay, the Emperor Sheng Zhu was the third emperor of the Ming dynasty. And he was responsible for the rebuilding and the rebirth that we just spoke about. The wall, the canal, the forbidden city. But he also established trade and diplomacy with other countries. And it later became known as Yongla, 
the the emperor, the third emperor, the Ming emperor, Ming Empire, sorry, uh, sponsored the building of the Forbidden City. Also, a huge encyclopedia project. So, so you know, uh, <clears throat> expanding intellects. Uh, <clears throat> He uh, he sponsored the expeditions of Zhongla, Zhongha, sorry, <clears throat> and the reopening of China's borders to trade and travel. Um, okay. So <clears throat> mentioned Zhongha a couple times. So who is Zhongha? <clears throat> a very interesting man in history. Uh, one of the great explorers and adventurers, maybe a you know, similar to a, a Indiana Jones kind of guy, uh, seemingly had been everywhere in the world. <clears throat> uh, so known as a great Chinese explorer, and he set out at the command of the Emperor Shenzhou, and he visited many lands with the Chinese Navy <clears throat> to, to mostly establish maritime <clears throat> commerce. Again, it's all about trade, okay? So according to your book, Zheng Ha, also a eunuch, an imperial eunuch, had been sterilized. Also a Muslim, entrusted by the Ming Emperor Yangla, with a series of state voyages that took his gigantic ships through the Indian Ocean from Southeast Asia to Africa. So when I say uh, when I say uh, uh, gigantic ships, uh, this is the 1400s. So you know, at the end of the 1400s, you have the era of Columbus. If you were to take the three ships that, that, that sailed with Columbus on his first uh, first journey, those ships would be maybe one-third or less the size of, of Zheng Ha. He also might have dozens of these large ships on, on one of his journeys. Uh, and he traveled great distances in these very, very large ships. Um, so this, this man traveled the entire world literally. And allegedly, he even came to the Americas. Chinese come to the Americas before Columbus, so this is news. Of course, the Americas became later known as the New World after Columbus. But according to Chinese, Zheng Ha got here before Columbus did. And, and this continues this very long debate about who got here first. Who got to North and South America first? Uh, was it Columbus? Was it the Vikings? The Africans have a, a uh, you know, a, a story about coming across the Atlantic themselves and, and hitting the American continent before Columbus did. And now the Chinese with, with Zheng Ha. Okay, so... <clears throat> It's interesting, this obsession with, with European people and Middle Eastern people or African people uh, and now even the Chinese about why it's so important about who got here first. So, you know, again, we don't use the word discover anymore because when they got here, there were 20 million people living on North and South America. So why does it matter who got here first when 20 million people got here before you did? But this continues to be a, a uh, competition about who could say that they came here first. You know, the Vikings, there's, there's more and more evidence every day that the Vikings were here before Columbus. And this has really been helped along with modern technology and, and especially satellite imagery that, that's helping archaeologists find, you know, um, locations of of settlements or, or something that have to do with the Vikings and, and more. And that, that's a pretty exciting uh, part of archaeology today is, is the Vikings in the New World. Um, but the truth is uh, Columbus will always be the one credited with starting the wave of people. So he, he didn't know it was here. He found it. He thought he was in, in India. That's why the people were called the people Indians. But when he finally realized it was a new continent, or, or Europe did, much of Europe saw it as, oh my gosh, this incredibly vast land is there, and the opportunities in Europe are dwindling, and the opportunities for common people are just next to nil. We're never going to have land. We're never going to rise above. But in the new world, perhaps you can. So so while Columbus is somewhat fallen from grace in, in history because of his abuse of the people that he was in contact with when he first got here, and of course not the discoverer of anything with 20 million people here, 
he does have a, a important place in history as being the European they opened the floodgates of all these people that came and you could argue that they're still coming uh, and of course this this changed dramatically uh, the uh, path of the indigenous peoples that were here North and South America the Native Americans you know these these Europeans came and and you know slaughtered them and committed genocide brought their diseases they all died you know, the Native American lifestyle came to an end or, or, or the opening act of that lifestyle coming to an end was when Columbus hit the shores okay uh, let's go to our next uh, film here please watch the film entitled Zheng Ha the Chinese Muslim explorer who reached America before Columbus okay uh, so uh, be patient with this film the, the narrator's got a got a, a, a uh, an act that, that, that's hard to understand sometimes so there's there's captions so read the captions a lot of good information here go ahead and watch that film and then come on back okay so so like the like the film mentioned um, after visiting Somalia in in Africa Zheng Ha brought back a giraffe for the Emperor now I don't I don't know I'm just, I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, I've heard that many times, but it's hard to imagine. Can, can you imagine, uh, you know, what, five, six, ten men, uh, you know, trying to trying to capture uh, a wild giraffe in Africa? You know, a giraffe is probably, I don't know, 15, 20 feet tall. It's taller than two or three men. If you, if you put, you know, men on top of each other, standing on each other's shoulders, would be more than three men I would say that a, a giraffe's legs are probably higher than than a person standing next to them so you, so you have to somehow um, gain control of this wild animal that's really big this really long neck and head then you gotta what hog tie it somehow I guess and get it from running away and then you gotta somehow drag it or transport it in some way carry it back to your ship now, do you do you put it in the in the bottom of your ship hogtied? I mean, it probably wouldn't live. So, do you untie it and put it on on the deck? It's it's 20 feet tall. I, I mean, you know, it's 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 kind of ridiculous. Do you put it down below and make it make it kind of you know put its head to the side? It's hard to imagine that you could take a giraffe on a long voyage at sea. But this is a story that that you hear about Zheng Ha. Okay, our next section in our book, Civilization and Militarism in East Africa, 1200 to 1500. What are some of the similarities and differences in how Korea and Japan responded to the Mongol threat? So other countries, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, and we talked about them in our last chapter, kind of their, their beginnings. These three were also affected by the Mongol hordes. But out of the three, Korea was soundly defeated and put under harsh Mongol control, while Japan, and with an amazing story, we'll learn about that here in a minute, and Vietnam mostly escaped the Mongols. Uh, so starting with ancient Korea, and I mentioned that the Mongols had their eyes on Korea because they wanted to use it as a base for their invasions. Uh, obviously, if you're going to invade somebody, you want to get as close to them as you can, not from a thousand miles away. You can't invade somebody from a thousand miles away because you have to supply your army. So you want to get as close as you can and then go from there. So the Mongols saw Korea as a base to do that in places like Japan and in Vietnam in their future. Uh, okay, so the, so the Mongols occupied Korea until the 1350s. In 1392, the brilliant Korean general Yi Sung Gi set up the Chosun dynasty. Gi reduced Buddhist influence and set up a government based upon Confucian principles. With a few generations, Confucianism had made a deep impact on uh, the Korean life. Uh, so reduces Buddhism and pushes more towards Confucius. So there's Confucius again, always, always there. Uh, so you have the, the Joseon and the Chosun dynasty. Uh, 
this was a Korean state founded by uh, Taizhou. Uh, uh, Yi Sung Gi, that lasted for approximately five centuries. Uh, so the Chosun dynasty, also known as the Joseon dynasty, uh, same thing. Uh, our book says Chosun, but J Joseon is, is also a name for it. Also called the Yi dynasty. Uh, and and the, so the Chosun ruled over a united Korean peninsula for more than 500 years, from 1392 until 1897, not that, not that long ago. Uh, so who are the Chosun? According to your book, the Chosun dynasty ruled Korea from the fall of the Kareo kingdom to the colonization of Korea by Japan. So Kareo is where the name Korea comes from. Uh, so the Mongols, like I said, used Korea as a base on the coast for invasions else, elsewhere. And they're eyeing Japan. But they also want to dominate and control the maritime trading routes. So we're going to, we're going to set up there and take over the trade routes. Uh, but but uh, Korea's last dynasty continues to you know, influence society in, in modern day Korea today. Uh, cultural innovations and achievements are still, still part of their, of their culture today. Okay, 1392, General Yi Sung Yi took the throne and took the name King Tajo. Okay, King Tajo declared himself the founder of the kingdom of the great Joseon, or Chosun in your book. Uh, okay, and the first few years of Tajo's rule, uh, dissatisfied nobles regularly threatened to mutiny. So he was not a popular ruler by any means. Uh, so to shore up his power, uh, Tajo declared himself the founder of the kingdom of the great Joseon and wiped out the rebellious members of the old dynasty's clan, the kingdom of the great Joseon. And he wiped out the, re the rebellious members. Uh, so, so King Tajo also signaled a fresh start by moving the capital to the present-day city known as Seoul. And he built architectural wonders in the new capital, including the, the Gyeongbuk Palace, completed in 1395, and the Cheongdyakgung Palace in 1405. Uh, King Tajo would rule until 1408. Uh, so the Joseon culture and power reached a new pinnacle under Tajo's great-grandson, King Shijong, the Great. Uh, what's his legacy? Uh, 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 Shijong Cultural Center, Research Center, uh, movies, TV shows, t streets named after him, currency stamps, all these things today still talk about King Shijong the Great in, in China. Uh, okay, so King Shijong was so wise, so the story goes, that even as a young boy, uh, that his two older brothers actually stepped aside so he could become king. So, of course, you know, it's all about succession. The oldest son is first in line to the throne. If he was to die, the second oldest son would come in. But in this case, both older sons step aside to let Shijong take over because he was just so wise. And they stepped aside to let him do that. You don't see that very often. Uh, in t two different times, 1592, 1597, the Japanese used their samurai army to attack Joseon, Korea. And their ultimate goal was to conquer Ming China. Uh, and, you know, the, the victorious Japanese, uh, you know, kind of went to atrocities here, cut off the ears and noses of more than 38,000 Korean victims. Uh, Korean slaves revolted against their Korean masters to join the Japanese invaders. And together they burnt everything down. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the Ming Dynasty <clears throat> was, was also um, weakened by the effort of fighting off the Japanese uh, that, that soon fell to the Manchu state of China. And this is where the Qing Dynasty was established. So not the Qin, Qin, or the G at the end. Uh, okay, looking at Japan, after securing Korea, the Mongols turned towards Japan. Uh, and they came in 1274 with a huge, overwhelming army. And while successful at first with their invasion of Japan, a freak storm forced them back to mainland Korea. After that, Kublai Khan demanded that the, that the Japanese submit to Mongol rule. Uh, he sent emissaries to Japan to negotiate on um, taking over. But the Japanese executed the emissaries. They didn't care. So, of course, they realized that because of that, they're going to invade again. So Japan prepared for the obvious Mongol invasion that was sure to come. And in 1281, they came. But a combination of a seawall that gave the Mongols nowhere to land and the use of steel swords to cut the Mongols down held them at bay. And then, amazingly, another storm hit, a typhoon struck, sinking half of the Mongol fleet. So talk about luck. Uh, in fact, two storms, seven years apart, two freak storms uh, during these both these Mongol invasions turned the Mongols back and saved Japan from being conquered by the, by the Mongols. Uh, let's do a supplemental lecture right here, and we'll go into deeper detail about this. We've talked about some of this, but we'll, we'll go a little bit deeper here. So this is number 13. This is called Kamikaze. Uh, let's look at our outline. You probably heard the, 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 the name Kamikaze before. Uh, so number one is introduction. The Mongol invasions of the 13th century is where Kamikaze comes from, although you might be f familiar with it more from the pilots of World War II, the Kamikaze pilots in Japan. Uh, number two, the Mongols. Talk about these two invasions, 1274, 1281, and elaborate about each one, but briefly. And talk to me about how the whole thing started over pirates. Number three is the results. What were the results? Both, of, both invasions were averted by two of these freak storms. And this is called the divine wind or kamikaze. And number four, of course, is always at the end we will talk about the relevance, okay? Okay. So for many years, the Japanese would speak of the divine wind that saved Japan from Mongol invasion. The Japanese word for divine wind is kamikaze. These failed invasions from these storms, or, the, or this divine wind, uh, cost the Mongols a lot of men and money and led to the beginning of the decline of the Mongol Empire. So, of course, this is legendary in Japanese history, and this is where the word kamikaze comes from, this, these 13th century invasions. So, according to your book, kamikaze means the divine wind, which the Japanese credited with blowing the Mongol invaders away from their shores in 1281, also 1274. A divine wind from God came out of nowhere. No one saw it coming, no reason for it to happen. But, it, but these two storms did not allow the Mongols to land and conquer, push them away, and these and they happened seven years apart. Uh, and so because of this divine wind, these storms, the, this kamikaze, they call it, uh, the Japanese avoided being conquered by the Mongols. And this would eventually result in the decline of the Mongol Empire. So in the 1270s and 80s, the menacing forces of the Mongols attacked Japan two different times. But through courage, determination, but mostly good luck, because of these storms, the Japanese drove them off both times. It was an inspiration to future generations of Japanese right up to World War II, and that is where they got the name Kamikaze Pilots from the divine wind of the Mongol invasions. So today we think of the 
of the World War II Japanese fighter pilots that would sacrifice their lives. Suicide mission. Crash their planes into a strategic location of their enemy. Usually a ship at sea. They would fly into the command center and, you know, blow it up. Uh, so it was an honor to be a kamikaze pilot, even though you've sacrificed your life. Your family would, would always be honored and, you know, uh, revered because, because your family had a kamikaze pilot. Uh, but, but again, the word kamikaze did not start here in World War II. It started in the 13th century during the Mongol invasions of Japan. So in the 1260s, going back to Kublai, the Mongols under Kublai Khan were sweeping across East Asia, taking on the Song Chinese. And of course, they're, they're, they're Mongols. They, they proved to be an intimidating and unrelenting military force. As he was fighting the Chinese, though, Kublai had his eye on Japan. So in 1266, he thought he'd write Japan, you know, a, a, a letter uh, demanding that they accept him as overlord. Uh, like, let's not even have a war. I'm just going to step in and become the overlord. Or, and he said, who would prefer to resort to war? Well, nobody wants to fight the Mongols. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the tensions between the Japanese and the Mongols did not just come from Mongol aggression. Japanese pirates also played a role in the conflicts between these two. So pirates were a re reoccurring problem in the seas around Japan. The pirates showed no respect for borders that nations tried to impose. Uh, these pirates were a mixture of Japanese, Korean, and Chinese sailors. And they would rob wherever they thought they could get away with it. So, you know, a pirate's got no loyalties. They're going to rob whoever they can get stuff from, whoever's, whoever's weaker. Uh, they don't have any qualms about robbing anybody. Uh, so they robbed everybody and got away with it. Uh, this is all going on while Japan was struggling to keep law and order. So because they had their hands filled with that, the pirate problem was ignored. You know, the officials were busy with the nation's internal problems. So they turned a blind eye to what the pirates were doing. But Kublai Khan had a problem with the pirates. And he, and he contacted the Japanese, asking them to deal with their pirate problem because it's affecting the Mongols. But they failed to address the issue, and they didn't do anything about it. So Kublai's demands escalated. But again, Japan's ruling class was riddled with all kinds of tensions. Uh, so although the emperor reigned over the country, he did not really rule it, and we knew this, the, the, the rule fell to the shogun, a, a military dictator who governed. Uh, so there were tensions between the noble clans and their samurai warriors, competing for land and position with the nation. Uh, so of course you got all this going on, and even though, you know, Kublai might think it's a big deal, but the, uh, the, uh, the Japanese don't don't think so. You know, we, we, we can't we can't deal with this right now. So the issues degenerated into the to the point where the Mongols finally just said we're gonna invade Japan. And this first Mongol invasion of twelve seventy four CE is launched. And the Mongols bring uh, uh, soldiers recruited from Korea. Now they had just conquered Korea so, of course, Korea is being subservient, and these Koreans are forced to join the Mongol army to invade Japan. So the Khan was able to vastly increase the size of his invasion force. So an immense number of troops were crammed into hundreds of boats, and they set sail for Japan. And initially, the Mongol forces were overcoming Japanese resistance. The invasion, in fact, reached the mainland. But the two nations had very different ways of fighting. Uh, Japanese warfare laid great emphasis on individual courage and skill. It was honorable. But the Mongols didn't care about that. The Mongols used enormous amounts of troops. They packed together in groups. And out of the groups, they would fire swarms of arrows uh, hurled out of those formations, usually high in the sky, and they'd all come down 
on the Japanese, you know, raining down the Japanese, like raining arrows, hundreds, maybe thousands of arrows coming down from the sky uh, uh, on the Japanese soldiers. They also uh, would fling firebombs from catapults. Uh, so all of this was not fighting as the samurai knew it. It wasn't their way at all. But the Japanese adapted to the threat. And their fighting skills, in fact, turned the war against the Mongols uh, and, their, and their massed ranks of Chinese and Korean soldiers. Uh, so the Mongols were forced to make a tactical withdrawal, returning to their boats. And then the first storm came in. A heavy storm forced the Mongols to retreat. As they set sail and retreated, it damaged their fleet. And you know, many ships were sunk. And they just retreated and left. The invasion was over. The Japanese were able to you know, stop them from invading. But of course, they knew that the threat still remained. That Kublai Khan was not going to let that go. So in 1279, Kublai, begins planning a second invasion of Japan with, that would happen in 1281. Uh, but the Japanese knew that they were coming uh, the second time. So they'd been busy uh, because they knew that the Mongols would return in force. So they built strong defenses against them. Again, the sea walls you know, that, that don't allow a, a ship or troops to, to land. Uh, this extensive stone wall. Uh, but the Mongol fleet, fleet sorry, set sail in 1281, even larger than the first one. So Kublai Khan sent 23,000 troops to invade Japan in 1274. And as we know, the Mongol fleet was sunk by storm and forced to return to you know, go home. In 1281, he's got 150,000 troops. So now he's got, you know, a tremendous amount more, more people. He's not going to lose this time. Uh, and, and, you know, hopefully they were better prepared than before. But, but the Japanese harassed the fleet before it even reached their coasts. While they were still out in the water approaching Japan, the Japanese harassed them. And they would, they would send nighttime raids by bands of men in small ships that you couldn't see coming. And it made life difficult for the Mongols, uh, these raids that came out of nowhere. In one dramatic encounter, 30 samurai swam. Like they swam there to a Mongol ship, got on board quietly, secretly, defeated the crew, and cut off all of their heads and swam away. So, of course, if you're at the Mongol ship next to that ship, you're, you're like, oh my gosh, you, you have a feeling of dread. Even the, though you're the big bad Mongols, like, wow, that, that's pretty scary. So this resulted in a decline in Mongol morale. Uh, but while this is all going on, uh, you've also got the uh, summer sun, you know, blazing down upon the Mongols and their Chinese forces while they're all lining their boats off the coast of Japan. So the Mongol existence was miserable, confined, hot, not exactly the glorious invasion that they had promised that they were coming back to finish the job. Uh, as the end of summer approached, the typhoon system, I'm sorry, season came. Uh, these huge storms, like a hurricane almost. And on August 15th, a terrible storm descended upon the fleet. And this time, far more devastating than, than the storm that struck the first invasion. This was much worse. It smashed the Mongol ships and scattered those that remained. And they again had to retreat with what was left of them. This is referred to as the divine wind. Clans usually competed against each other in Japan, but the Japanese came together to repel Mongol invasions in 1274, 1281. On both occasions, the Japanese were helped greatly when the Mongol fleet was destroyed by powerful typhoons, hurricanes. The Japanese called these kamikaze or divine winds. Uh, in answer to their prayers, the Mongol invasion force had been destroyed twice, and the Mongols would never again come close to invading Japan. The defeat of the Mongols by the kamikaze was an iconic moment 
uh, the attempted Mongol invasion and its end helped to shape Japan. Uh, Buddhist shrines, you know, associated with the divine intervention, uh, intervention, the divine wind, grew in prestige. Uh, so Japan was brought together by the external threat from the Mongols. The samurai cooperated in a way that they had not done for years. So the so the the legacy of the Mongol invasions of Japan and their failure in both cases brought a period of relative unity to, to Japan that they hadn't had in a while. Uh, so the, the legend of the divine win of the Kamikaze, a 13th century war, was remembered in the 20th century due to the divine wind or the Kamikaze. Okay, to end the supplemental lecture, here's the relevance, a little bit longer than usual. Uh, the divine wind is a legend of shared courage and resistance. A devastating force that would answer their country's prayers and turn back any invaders. This is what the suicide bombers of World War II thought when they took on the title of kamikaze. They were the modern versions of that. One more time, the relevance. The divine wind is a legend of shared courage and resistance. A devastating force that would answer their country's prayers and turn back any invaders. This is what the suicide bombers of World War II thought when they took on the title of kamikaze. They were the modern version of that. Okay, that is the end of supplemental lecture number 13, kamikaze. Okay, moving on, the Ashikaga shogunate. Uh, Ashikaga Tak Takawaji led a revolt of the Bushi that overthrew the Kamakura regime and established the Ashikaga shogunate. Um, still talking about Japan here. And you have the flight of the emperor to Yoshino. So who were the, the Bushi? Uh, the Bushi uh, were the military nobility of medieval and early modern Japan. Mm -hmm. Uh, in 1333 to 1338, the Emperor Godego tried to reclaim power from the shoguns, but was defeated by the Ashikaga shogunate in 1338. So Godego starts a civil war in Japan, and he tries to reclaim the power from the shoguns. Uh, and this would lead to the dissolution of the Kamakura shogunate. Uh, Godego's defeat led to the rise of the Ashikaga Shogunate. Uh, according to your book, the Ashikaga Shogunate, the second of Japan's military governments headed by a shogun or again a military ruler, uh, sometimes called the Muromachi Shogunate. Okay, the last of our countries is Vietnam. Uh, and Vietnam was known as the Anum by the Chinese. Uh, so Vietnam also managed to avoid being conquered by the Mongols, although they were forced to pay tribute to the Yuan Empire uh, when they were under Mongol rule. But they avoided being conquered, mostly because the Mongols were focused elsewhere. So we, we remember Vietnam and their Champa rice, that rice that could be harvested twice in one year. Uh, the Champa... Uh, were conquered by Annam or Vietnam in this era and established the state based on Confucianism and 1500 the start of modern day Vietnam was born. But, but for our, our, our story here, uh, like Japan, but for much different reason, Japan and Vietnam managed to avoid being conquered by the Mongols. Uh, in the case of, of Vietnam, the Mongols were focused elsewhere, luckily for them. Okay, that is the end of chapter 12. Thank you.